studies show that your attitude can have a greater impact on your success than your IQ. You can be extremely talented, have incredible potential, but if you don't have the right attitude, it will keep you from rising higher. And we spend all kinds of time and money making sure the outside looks good. Eating right, working out, wearing the latest fashions, and that's all fine, but too often, we're not spending any time on the inside. Nice clothes won't cover up a bad attitude. A pretty face, perfect makeup, won't hide being bitter on the inside. If you stay positive in a negative situation, you win. What exactly are you winning? You're winning the war against negativity. You're winning the war against despair. You're winning the war against stress. And you know, negativity, it is a sneaky little bastard. Let me tell you something. Because it sort of creeps into your life, it creeps into your mind, it creeps into your skin and into your blood pressure. And before you even realize it, you started to succumb to it. And how do you know that you are succumbing to negativity? Well, first of all, it depletes you. It, it, it has a heaviness to it. It has an intensity to it. And when you succumb to negativity, it changes your character. You snap at your kids, you snap at your teammates, you feel stuck, you feel on edge, you feel tense. And that's why I want to talk to you about the power of your attitude right now. Because your brain is a pattern recognizing machine. And when you succumb to negativity, whether you think you're doing it or not, your brain will automatically start to see more negativity and feel more negativity, which is why it's so easy to get stuck ruminating and worrying and in this sort of loop that you can't get out of. Now, why do you want to build a positive attitude as a habit right now? Well, first of all, because a positive, powerful attitude is infectious. It inspires other people. It makes you resilient. And from a mindset perspective, it will help you spot more positive things. What positive things could you spot? You can spot opportunities. You can spot solutions to the problems that you're feeling. You can spot problem solving strategies. You can spot ways to connect. You can spot ways to be more innovative. And so positive attitude reads more positivity. That's why I want to teach you how to do it, because it's a strategy. Did you hear that word? So a powerful, positive attitude is not only a habit I want you to develop, but it is a strategy. And you're deploying other strategies right now to make you strong and to make you safe. You're washing your hands, you're getting supplies, you're editing your news intake, you're connecting with friends, developing the habit of a powerful attitude is a strategy. And when you practice having a powerful attitude, what happens is it becomes a habit. What's a habit? It's just a pattern that you repeat. So instead of succumbing to negativity, which can become its own habit, your powerful attitude becomes a habit. And look, I'm not talking about like saccharine, stupid, unrealistic, throw caution to the wind, let's just be positive, I'm positive I'm not going to get this, I'm positive I should go on spring break because I'm not at risk, I'm positive that I don't have to worry about that, that's not positivity, that's stupidity, okay? What I'm talking about is the kind of powerful attitude where you are able to see opportunity in any moment, where you are able to keep your wits about you in any moment, where you are able to have an attitude about what you're facing that keeps you strong and keeps you in control, that your attitude day to day is keeping you anchored. So even when the headlines come in, if you happen to see them and they wig you out and you feel yourself succumbing, you can go right back to boom, having a powerful attitude. A bad attitude makes you unattractive. It overrides what's on the outside. It's important to look good, 
to develop your skills, to get an education, but it's even more important to keep a good attitude. Nobody wants to be around a sour, critical, condescending person. Colossians 3, in the message translation says, dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. Kindness, compassion, and humility. As parents, sometimes we pick out clothes for our children to wear. Our Heavenly Father has picked out something for us all to wear. Kindness, being good to people, being pleasant to be around. When you're kind, you draw people to you. When you're good-natured, friendly, opportunity will come your way. People want to do business with people that they like. When we're hiring someone, their resume tells us what they can do, what their skills are, but we always meet with them to see what their attitude is. Are they positive? Are they friendly, kind, considerate? We can find someone else with the same skills. The real question is, do they have the attitude that's going to take us higher? They may be gifted, but a negative attitude will pull the team down. Your attitude is going to determine your altitude. It will determine how high or how low you go. Well, Joel, I've always been kind of negative, critical, condescending. That's just who I am. No, that's who you're choosing to be. That's not who you are. That may be how you were raised. That's what you saw growing up, but that's not how you have to stay. Try being kind, friendly, good natured. You'll not only enjoy life more, but you'll go further. If you have a nose high attitude, if you're positive, you see the best, you're kind to people, you have a smile, because your nose high, you're going to continue to rise higher. You're going to see God's blessings and faith. But if you're sour, hard to get along with, you don't want to go to work, bitter over disappointments, because you have a nose down attitude, your life is going to go that direction. And sometimes we're discouraged over what we brought on ourselves. It's not the enemy, it's our attitude. The good news is, all you have to do is make an attitude adjustment. It's not complicated. You can't change other people. You can't change how you were raised. A lot in life we can't control. But one thing we can all control is our attitude. Am I going to live this day negative, sour, seeing the wrong, chip on my shoulder? Or am I going to live it in faith? positive, hopeful, seeing the best, being good to people. This is a choice that we have to make every day. If you're going to have a good attitude, you have to do it on purpose because there will be all kinds of negative things that try to creep in. Bitterness, discouragement, self-pity. If you're not proactive, if you don't choose the right attitude, then the wrong attitude will show up. I wonder what would happen in your life if you would make a small tweak. Instead of going to work sour, dreading the day, feeling unappreciated, you would show up with a smile, grateful to have the job, knowing that you're not working under people, you're working under God, that He's keeping the records. That's what allows God to change things. What would happen in your marriage, your relationships, if you'd make a small attitude adjustment, instead of being contentious, hard to get along with, you'd start being friendly, loving, respectful. Instead of saying harsh, critical words, you'd start giving compliments, telling your spouse how much you love them, how blessed you are to have them in your life. Just a small adjustment. Getting your attitude a little higher, watch those relationships begin to improve. Or maybe you've had bad breaks. Life hasn't treated you fair. It's easy to get sour, go around with the chip on our shoulder, focus on what's wrong. That's a nose down attitude. You're choosing the direction you're going to go. Why don't you tilt it a little nose high? Yes, it was unfair, but I know God is my vindicator. I know God is fighting my battles. God promised to pay me back double for the unfair things that have happened. 
You keep that up and you'll see God make up for the wrongs. You think you bad? How bad do you really think you are? Are you really bad enough to know what it is that you want? Are you bad enough to go through the challenges in life? Or are you just someone that like to fake the funk? Pretending to be something that you're not. How bad do you really want it? Do you understand what that means? Do you understand how aggressive you gotta be? Do you understand even when you're aggressive, you still gotta have patience? Do you really understand the work that has to be applied to it? Because you can want all day long, but if you don't apply action to it, then how can you achieve? How can you achieve the greatness that's within you? How bad do you really want it? Do you want what's coming? Or do you even understand what's coming? Can you even comprehend it? A lot of people ain't ready for it. Maybe you're not ready for it. Maybe you're not understanding exactly what it's gonna really take to get to that point in your life where you can accept the fact that, hey, this is it. I got to put that work in. I got to apply myself. How bad do you want it? That's all you ever talked about. It's all you ever dreamed about. All you did was wait around, hoping that someone was just going to hand you the keys to the city. No one is just going to hand you over their keys and expect you to drive. In fact, you don't even have a license to understand what it means to get what it is you really want. So if you're not in the mindset, if you're not prepared, if you're not willing, if you're not able, you can forget about it. You don't have to have a complicated idea to make a difference in your life. What you need are ideas that you apply. Most of us go through life sleepwalking, never really discovering our true potential, never enjoying life to its full extent. And so, therefore, I think that there are some things that we need to begin to do to take charge of our destiny. Joy comes when you're spontaneous. It's really hard to be truly happy when you're not being yourself. And most of us have no clue who we are. And so a big part of my work, if you've ever been to an event, you know, is to get people to do things spontaneously without thinking, because that's when the real you shows up. That's when the energy comes alive. And when you do that, when you start to connect to your true nature, suddenly there's energy available for you to set a higher standard for what you want in your life. That's what this is really all about. And when I talk about standards, when I talk about, you know, shoulds versus musts, think about your own life. I know there have been areas in your life where some point in time you just shifted and you raised the standard and your life changed. Because whatever people have their identity attached to, they live. We live who we believe we are. That's just how it works. It's just kind of like, I'll give you an example. Look at your physical body. Your physical body today is an absolute reflection of only one thing. Not your goals, not your desires, but your standards. The identity you have for yourself. If your standard is you're an athlete, then there's a certain amount of strength, a muscle tone, an energy that's available in your body on a regular basis because that's who you are. And so you do whatever is necessary to maintain that identity. Again, the strongest force in the human personality is this need to stay consistent with how we define ourselves. So think about this idea. What does it take to, to be in charge of your destiny? Well. You've got to begin to develop some skills and you've got to ask yourself a question. Uh, what do you have going for you? What is it that you have going for you right now that's a real plus for you? What is it that you have going against you? What kind of tra training do you require? What is it that you need to learn? See, you, you make money only one of three ways in an economy of this nature. You have to have a skill, like I've developed the skill to become a speaker, or have some specialized knowledge, or have a particular product that, or service that you can provide for the public. The two controlling forces have directed your life and kept you at times from taking action. And those forces again are the twin forces of pain and pleasure. Remember, everything we do in life, we do out of our need to avoid pain or our desire to gain pleasure. As you begin to look at life, as you begin to look at the things you want to do, decide that you're going to become the active force in your life. Decide that you're not going to go through life feeling like a victim. Decide that when things become challenging, and they are, that you're not going to personalize it, that you're going to look at it, 
and you do whatever you must do in order to work things out and learn from it. Learn from it. That's the key. I like what Charles Udall said. He says, in life, you will always be faced with a series of God-ordained opportunities brilliantly disguised as problems and challenges. If you've lost your job, don't say that I've been laid off. Just say, I've been given an opportunity by the universe to find my life work. So as you view all of the things that happen to you as an opportunity, now you're taking it from a different perspective. Now you become an active force in your life. Now you are the one, rather than running from things as they begin to change, you become a change driver because you know that you've got the power within you to make the difference. This force, this power, this energy that you have, that's more powerful than anything that can ever happen to you. You're more powerful than your circumstances or anything that you can experience right now. Decide that you're going to commit yourself to act on your ideas, to become happy. Commit yourself to live your dream. Commit yourself to become the architect of your future. There's something that I heard that Goethe wrote that I love very much. And, and it really, as you begin to, to operate out of this consciousness, you begin to experience a different level of living in terms of commitment. He says, until one is committed, there is hesitancy, the chance to draw back, always ineffectiveness. See, until you are willing to jump out there, somebody asked me, how do I do that? I said, no, 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 no. You don't need any answers now. You need to make the commitment. Once you make a commitment, then life will give you some answers. So what is it though? Why do we procrastinate? Why do we not use our power? Which is what we talked about on the first tape. Let's figure out what stops us. The reason is when we procrastinate, it's because we think that taking action, whatever action we're putting off, that taking that action would be more painful than doing nothing or not taking action. That's the bottom line. In other words, by not taking action, we experience less pain than taking action. Guess what I had to do at age 25 in order to change my own future. I had to change my mind. I had to change my thinking. I had to change my philosophy. I was messed up on what was causing my problem. And once I got that straightened out, that all the stuff I blamed, government and taxes, and the marketplace and the economy and things cost too much, negative relatives, cynical neighbors. Once I got rid of that and started going for where the real problem was, which was me, I'm telling you, my life exploded into change. My bank account changed immediately. My income changed immediately. My whole life took on a whole new look and color immediately. And the early results I got from making these philosophical changes tasted so good, I've never stopped the process from that day. And I'm telling you, with a little consideration of the refinement of your sail, by setting a better sail, refining your philosophy, your whole life can start to change from today on. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. You don't have to wait till next month. You don't have to wait till spring. You don't have to wait till 93 and start this whole process immediately. I recommend it. Now, some people do so little thinking, they don't even have their sail up. I mean, you can imagine where they're going to wind up at the end of this week, at the end of this month, at the end of this year. Now's the chance to change, process all this information. So number one is philosophy. And we dealt with all that, where we get ideas, personal experience, from other people's experiences. I don't want to get into all those details because we covered that the last time I was here. But philosophy, that's number one. What is procrastination? It's the opposite of using your personal power. It's being immobilized. It's needing to do something and not following through. I call it the silent killer because it grows on you. It just kind of creeps along until pretty soon it's taking control of your life. Pretty soon you find yourself immobilized in a bunch of areas and you don't even realize it. You don't even notice all the freedom you've given up just because of procrastination. I don't know what that dream is that you have. I don't care how far-fetched it might appear to be. I don't care how disappointing it might have been as you've been working toward that dream. But here's what I know. Someone's opinion of you does not have to become your reality. In the process of working on your dreams, you are going to incur, incur a lot of disappointment, a lot of pain, a lot of setbacks, but in the process of doing that, you will discover some things about yourself that you don't know right now. What you'll realize is that you're more powerful than you can ever begin to imagine. Anybody who is determined to do something, who wants something to be different, it will eventually be different. You're gifted, you're talented, 
God has much bigger plans for you in your life. Everything around you is going to change as soon as you change the things around you. It's very simple. You can be in the hood, change your mind and everything about your bank account, your surroundings, your environment for your kids, the safety of any and everything going on will all change. I'm tired of everybody running around complaining as if you're on the receiving end of whatever this world wants to dump on you and you don't have a choice. It's time to grow up, man. It's tired of people to really get out of this, ex like excuses sound best to the person that's making them up. I want you to be successful. I want you to stop coming up with reasons and excuses as to why you're doing the same shit over and over and over and over. You want friends who, when something good happens to you, they're, that's good for you, right? They're happy about that. They're not like all bitter and resentful underground and like saying horrible things behind your back and telling you how they did something that was better and trying to drag you down. It's like that's not helpful. And then. When something bad happens to you and you go to them and you say, look, this terrible thing happened to me. First of all, they don't try to top it with some like horrible thing that happened to them because they don't have the patience to listen. And second, they're not secretly gloating about the fact that catastrophe finally befell you. It's like they're actually hurt by it. And that, that chapter is an injunction. It's like, take a look at the people that are around you. And if they're not on the side of what's good for you, then walk away. You know, nothing happens unless you change. So change is not our enemy, it's our friend. There's a season that you may go through a difficult period, but that is to wake up your ability to change. You cannot become what you were born to be unless you are willing to change into something you are not. This is why change is so important. Uh, I like what it says here. Uh, Shakespeare says, sweet are the uses of adversity. We never grow in good times. We never advance unless we're under pressure. Change comes to improve and to advance your life, not to destroy you. I think that we often forget this. And we're going to face hardships. We can't avoid pain. We can't avoid trouble. All we can do is prepare our mindset so that we don't get overwhelmed by our circumstances. A lot of people, when they have a negative circumstance take place in their life, um, they react negatively to it. I mean, that seems almost natural. In fact, that is natural. Something negative happens to me, my reaction back to it is negative. But this is why you have to change your mindset. Life isn't what happens to you when you're looking. What happens to you when you're looking is called a plan. Life is what happens to you when you're not looking, when your guard is down, when your back is tired. It's going to work on a Friday morning, feeling good and having your boss call you in. And you know she has a look on her face and you know that look isn't good. You know the economy isn't so hard and we've got to let you go. And all we can think about are those three kids you have out. You know life is coming home from work and finding that note on the kitchen table saying, hey, I can't do this anymore. I'm sorry, I love you, but I've got to go. And you're frustrated and you're betrayed and you're furious and you're angry, but all you want to do, all you want to do is hold up again. All you want to do is hear those words whispered in your ear, I love you again. You know, that's life. How do you handle that? How do you deal? with that, those sort of situations. You see, it's been said a hundred times and I, I'll say it again, you've got to go through it. That's all it is, you've got to go through it. And going through it is not a function of, of just being courageous. It's not a function of just saying, well, I'm going to close my eyes and see what happens next. It's not that, it's really a function of three things. It's a beginning, it's a middle, and an end. And before you go through it, there's a choice. You make a choice to say, well, I'm either going to stay here or I'm going to be over there someday, somehow. It's a choice. So going through it and thinking about these three steps, beginning, middle, and end, you know, you can really save yourself a lot of trouble if you discover something more about yourself. It's called life and it's not personal. Stuff's going to happen. And if you make it to the 40-yard line, if you can make it to age 40, between 40 and 60, it begins to intensify. All kind of things happen. Between 40 and 60. My mother was diagnosed with breast cancer and finally died. Between 40 and 60, I was diagnosed with prostate cancer. Between 40 and 60, I went through a divorce from someone that I loved very much. Between 40 and 60, I had a nationally syndicated talk show, highest rated fastest cancer talk show in the history of television. Between 40 and 60, oh, life put a wicked old beat. 
I think the biggest vulnerability you've got is you actually value somebody's opinion more than you value your own. The reason I've been able to always do my thing is when I was 24 and people were like, oh, you work at your dad's liquor store? I heard that as like a chip on my shoulder, you know? I loved it. I was like, cool, keep sleeping, you know? Like, I'm glad you're on Wall Street making 100,000 buying BMWs and dumb jewelry to see you for years. Like, to me, the way you win is you realize you can't hear nobody. You gotta get real, real quiet up here. I can't hear anything. You go look at my Instagram right now, my first post, I'll post something, first 100 po- replies in one second, you're Jesus, you walk on water, you're the best, you're the all time, can't hear him. The next 100, you're a piece of shit. you're full of shit. you're a snake oil salesman, can't hear him. I'm in my, my own mind, doing my own thing. And that comes with self-esteem. Everybody's trying to keep up with the Joneses. I'm not worried about you renting out cash from the bank and putting it to your ear. I'm not worried you jumped a fence and took a photo in front of a private plane. What do you think these people are doing? They're posing. When you have goals and dreams you want to achieve, ask yourself the question, who should I count on and who should I count out? And so many people never achieve their goals because they have too many toxic, negative, energy draining people in their lives. And you have to have goals outside of your comfort zone that will challenge you because in order to do something you've never done, you've got to become someone you've never been. You know, I was homeless, man. I mean, you know, you're in a position where you're going, I got nowhere to go except up. I might as well keep hustling. I was in comedy. I just wasn't making nothing. All the money I was making, I was sending back home to my wife and kids. That didn't last long. She got tired of that real fast. But I couldn't go back to Cleveland because I wouldn't have enough money to drive back down south to perform. One time I drove to the house in Cleveland. I finally got enough money. I drove to the house in Cleveland and everybody was gone. I didn't see my kids for almost two years. They just left, boarded up the house. So next thing you know, I'm in the car. I lived there, but it taught me, it taught me determination, man. I'm a really, really determined person. It also taught me that no matter what happens to you, it ain't over. I was determined to be something. As long as God wakes you up. You may have given up on a dream. You think it's been too long. Now you've accepted that you'll never get well, never meet the right person, never start that business. What God put in your heart, he's not only still going to bring it to pass, but it's going to turn out better than you thought. I found that nothing in life is worthwhile unless you take risks. You have to take chances in life. If you don't take chances in life, you will never have the life God has for you. Life is risk. It take, it take courage to pursue your dream. Nelson Mandela said, there is no passion to be found playing small and settling for a life that's less than the one you're capable of living. So the first thing you have to think about when you're going through something is very simple. It's, I'm not where I want to be, but I know I can get there. I have faith that I'm going to get where I want to be. So yeah, go through the grieving process, grieve, accept that, say yes to that. You know, one day you look up and, you know, you're still in pain, you're still hurting, but you realize that, hey, it's not as bad as it was. It doesn't hurt as much as it did. And I'm moving forward, I'm moving forward. And at some point you emerge, you get to the other side, and you know that, hey, I haven't forgotten, but the pain doesn't hold you captive anymore. You're not crippled by the emotions, by the experience. You're not living out of, out of the past, out of your experiences of pain and defeat or betrayal. You're not living out of all that stuff. You're living in a new perspective. It's not what happens that determines the major part of your life. It's not what happens. What happens happens to us all. The key is what you do about it. What we really want is not just success, we want fulfillment. The way we get fulfillment is self-respect, is self-confidence. And that's how somehow in your life you must begin to separate what you do from what people think about it. The people that have really won in life and in business, they eventually drop the addiction to what other people think about them. They're most concerned about what they think about them or if they're a person of faith of what their God thinks about them, not the rest of the world. Because the higher you climb, the more haters you're gonna have. There's absolutely no question about it. You ought to hope you have more of them. The only thing I will warn people of is the higher you climb, the closer to you the haters are. 
So right now, if you're at one level of success, it's people at a distance that are haters. But as you climb higher, there's always the one or two people in your close circle who begin to try to pull you back down because they think you're leaving them. They make you, your success is making them uncomfortable about where they are. And so they begin to do everything they can to pull you back down. Be very careful of people who manipulate and play on your emotions. They get you to sympathize with them. They get you to feel sorry for them. This is not about being heartless. I need you to try your best to emotionally protect yourself from a specific characteristic. Some of y'all are so used to operating overweight, you're never gonna get there. And guess what? You love negativity and dysfunction and keeping these negative people in your life so much. Even everything about this video it makes you so uncomfortable, you probably stopped it a long time ago. I'm only talking to the people that are ready to get to the next level of their life and their career. And they're gonna boldly walk into the next season of their life. Unapologetically getting rid of all things, people, and situations that no longer belong. You run around with losers, you will end up a loser. Unconsciously, you will pick up their ways, you'll pick up their habits, you'll pick up, most importantly, their attitude about life. If you're around cynical, negative people all the time, you will become cynical and negative. Align yourself with people that can encourage you, people that can empower you, people that you can learn from, people that you can grow from. That's very important. You will start that process of change. Do something different the next 90 days than you did the last 90 days, like picking up the books to read. Do something different like the new health disciplines, relationship with your family, whatever it is, doesn't matter how small it is. If you'll start doing different things with the same circumstances, since we cannot change the circumstances, but we can change ourselves, we can change what we do. Anytime you go through something, there's a fight, it's either a spiritual fight, an emotional fight, a physical fight, there's some sort of fight. But the key to the whole thing of this fight is that the form is the fight. That's the only thing you should take away from here today. The form is in the fight. What does that mean? It means that you don't get to become this interesting, dynamic, creative, courageous woman, amazing man, without going through something. Right? That's what the form is. People who are form are the people who you see them and they stand out to you. Because you know there's something about them, they figured something out about life. They're attractive to you, they're interesting to you. These people have form because they've gone through something. You know, so don't run away from the fight. Meaning, go through it. Don't be afraid to go through it. Get through it because at the end of getting through it, I guarantee you there's at least one thing you discover about yourself. You discover that there's a version of you you haven't discovered yet. You don't even know exists yet. I don't have to tell you things are bad. Everybody knows things are bad. It's a depression. Everybody's out of work or scared of losing their job. The dollar buys a nickel's worth. We know the air is unfit to breathe and our food is unfit to eat. We sit watching our TVs while some local newscaster tells us that today we had 15 homicides and 63 violent crimes, as if that's the way it's supposed to be. We know things are bad, worse than bad. I don't want you to protest, I don't want you to ride, I don't want you to write to your congressman because I wouldn't know what to tell you to write. I don't know what to do about the depression and the inflations and the crime in the street. All I know is that first, you've got to say, I'm a human being, God damn it! My life has value! You want to align yourself with people who think like you, people who dream like you, people who want more out of life, people that are stretching and searching and seeking some higher ground in life. As opposed to the majority of people, somebody said, always strive to get on top in life because it's the bottom that's overcrowded. And so you don't want to be on the bottom. See, it's easy to be on the bottom. It doesn't take any effort to be a loser. It doesn't take any motivation, any drive in order to stay down there on a low level. But it calls on everything in you, ladies and gentlemen. You have to harness your will to say, I'm going to challenge myself. Sometimes I have to pull myself out of bed and say, come on, Les. Things I know I should do, I don't do. Things I shouldn't do, I do. I found that the biggest enemy you have to deal with is yourself. There's an old African proverb that says, if there's no enemy within, the enemy outside can do us no harm. Beware of vision, dream, and passion.
passion killers. Most of the people that have no dreams will wake up every day trying to talk you out of your dreams. They have no goals. They have nothing that they're ambitious about. So they will talk you out of all the shit that you're excited about. Family and friends, in most cases, sad to even say this, family and friends in most cases will be the first to try and talk you out of something that you're passionate, excited about, and that you have a vision for. You know, most of us in life, we, we work so hard for things. We think life's going to be a certain way. But as you're going to discover, life is never a straight line. You know, we're taught that. We think line is just, I'm going to go from here to there. But if you look in nature, you never see a straight line in real nature. If it's a straight line, a human built it. And so it's a process of evolving, of growing, dropping back, growing, dropping back. And, and challenges are what really grow us. You know, your life is a great story. You know, every person's life is a story. I say to people, you got to participate in your own rescue. You've got to retool yourself. Let me tell you something. Life can be long. You bury your dreams, you quit this, life gets long. See, time's relative. Two minutes of you being with your sweetie, doing whatever you like to do with them, that can go by quick, right? What's about the last two minutes on a treadmill? Does that not seem like it goes by for like four hours, right? So if you're enjoying it, it's short. If it's painful, it's long. Life can be long. See, there's a book being written about your life, isn't there? Someone somewhere is taking inventory of your life. Don't compare your chapter one to someone's chapter 10. You write your own book. And at any moment in your life, you can decide that you want to make this the new chapter. You're literally in your life, you can turn the page. And those previous chapters are your old book. It's like Old Testament, New Testament. Old story, new story. They're connected, they're related, but you can flip the page and you can have a whole new story. If you decide right now, I am literally turning, my breakthrough is I turn the page and in this second, I start to write the best chapters of my life. There are no skill sets in community colleges today for the most part that are going to prepare you for the economy or a job that's there. So what is that going to do? You're just going to waste more money, more time. We need to retool ourselves. The government's not going to do it for you. And a great leader in a company is retraining their people all the time. The training never stops because that is the innovative, creative marketing edge is your own people. I think you have to self-educate. I mean, I'm an example of that myself. You have to say, What's an area that I want to become masterful in because dabblers will never have any financial freedom. You know, if you're going to run a company, you got to find what is your niche? What is it you're going to do better than anybody else? Every one of us individuals have to say that and then say, now, where do I get that education? In a world that we live in today with the Internet, where there's education from all the world, from MIT, from Harvard, online, and there are people you can go to work for who you could become a mentee of. There's just so many approaches, but you can't have a standard education and expect to have an extraordinary life. It's not going to happen. The one breakthrough for all leaders is constant, never-ending improvement. And that means educating yourself and continuing to develop even greater emotional mastery because that's what affects whether you execute or not. The most beautiful thing about having dreams is that it's in your hands how big your dreams become. And this film taught me that. I've come here only to introduce you to the idea of saying that no one can tell you that your dream is too small or your dream cannot come true or your dream cannot be allowed because you're a girl, because you're a boy, because you look a certain way or because, because you come from a certain place. I'm not even Northeastern and I'm playing Mericom. I mean, who would have thought that? I am extremely honored to be sitting in front of all of you wonderful, wonderful, really smart people and talking to you about my dream, which came true doing this film. Don't be afraid to dream, guys, because they do come true. They really do. The key <laughs> to being a loser. Yeah, very is important. Not, is not loving and appreciating yourself. 
and align what other people think of you become more important to you than what you think of us. Wow. It's a new, new advice. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. That, that we were born to do something. You're here to do a work. The two most important moments in our lives, it's been said, the day that we're born and the day that we realize why we're born. And if you don't know, if you want to live a life of misery, don't try and find out. But if you want to live a life that has meaning and value and a sense of direction, spend as much time as you possibly can to answer the question, why am I here? And not so you will know yourself a lot yes, of time. Yes, so don't ask what is the meaning of life. Ask what is the meaning of my life? What am I supposed to do? What is this work that I was chosen, that God saw something in, in you, that you were chosen one out of 400 million sperm? He saw something in David. What was it that he saw? He saw something in Judy. He saw something in Les. There was something that caused us to be here. And I believe there's a work for us to do. There's something that if we don't do it, that the world will be deprived. And mm. finding out what that something is, that element, the element is when the what you love to do yeah. and what you were born to do come together that will allow you to show up in life in a bigger way. I think there's a lot of roads to the mountaintop. I have the perspective that I have because that was my journey. And I had to start figuring out how to how to walk in the darkness because that's kind of what it's like. At what the darkness? Beginning. What do you mean? Like meaning when you're caught in this psycho cybernetic loop. Can you define psycho cybernetics? Yeah. So um, it's this idea that um, what you believe uh, will dictate your thoughts on a moment by moment basis. So if you believe that you know money's hard to make as a simple example you're not going to have ideas or thoughts around money that would be lending to making it easily right uh and so so what you believe dictates what you think you can't get like a, an apple from an orange tree and what you think you then experience is an emotion right and then that emotion then dictates what actions you do or do not take and they're always aligned right your beliefs dictate your thoughts dictate your emotions dictate your actions which produce your results and your results, when you look at them, then just reinforce the original belief. And so we're caught in that construct, right? But the linchpin is the belief system. So the question is, how do I actually change what I believe? If my beliefs really do dictate my destiny, right? Which is, I'm not the only person suggesting that. And the question becomes, how do I change my beliefs? And in that is, is an inherent challenge because by definition, beliefs are that which are true right for us um, and so then then the question is how do we break out of this M my way of breaking out of it was at one point to understand and I'll start to kind of walk you through the structure of it to understand that there were only two states of emotional beingness that I could be in at any given point in time I would either be in a powerful state of being states like joy curiosity excitement calm peace passion or I would be in a primal state of being, boredom, anger, frustration, some form of fear. I'm always in one of those two states and I'm never in two states at one time. But those map beautifully to the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system, right? So in any moment, we're either in fight or flight or we're in rest and relaxation. Through my journey, what I realized was the only cause of that switch to be flipped was my own thinking. The meaning that I was giving the experience. The experience itself wasn't dictating whether I was in a primal state or a powerful state, whether I was in sympathetic fight or flight or parasympathetic rest and, rest, rest and restoration or relaxation. It was the meaning I was giving the experience. And so that meant that all of my personal suffering was within my own control. I needed to start controlling the meaning I was giving the experiences of life. Tell people your your concept of the paddle. Well, there's a paddle for everybody's ass. We all know that. And uh, 
Every day you just get up and I don't fear anything, but I worry about everything. And the day you stop worrying in good times, the paddle will get your behind. And 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 so as great as things are in life, I I know you're only a, a few steps or a few incidents away from something bad happening. You can never forget it. Did you have fear as a kid and you just got into enough business scuffles that you figured your way through things or have you always been fearless? I'm pretty fearless, but I do worry about everything. But, you know, once again, you know, the book, and this is why Harper's asked me to write the book because of all my Tillmanisms, you got to know what you know and what you don't know. And, and I knew that I understood business. Now don't ask me to, you know, go win an Emmy. I took guitar lessons for four years and I still struggle playing a guitar. I can't draw a stick person very good, but I knew that I understood business. So I, I, I know what I know and I know how to do due diligence on a deal. I don't worry about making a bad deal because I feel like I, I, that's what I know. So no fear when it comes to that. When did you realize in Chicago or Baltimore that you actually had a skill as an interviewer that was really better than anybody else's? And where do you think that skill came from? I never thought it was better than anybody else's. What I do think I have that is really uniquely my own is my ability to connect to the audience. Because my skill comes not from my interviewing ability. My skill comes from my listening ability. And my skill comes from me knowing fundamentally inside myself that I am no different than the audience. So what gave me the power in the seat and the power with the microphone was I always saw myself as the surrogate for the audience. So I would ask people questions that I would not normally ask. I mean, I asked some really embarrassing, uh, embarrassing question once, not because I wanted to know the answer, but because I thought the audience did. And then I thought, I'm not going to ask what the audience wants the next time. And when I get in that situation, it was a, it was a, I, I put myself in a bad situation. I asked Sally Field when she was dating Burt Reynolds. I asked, remember this, Gail? I asked Sally Field, did Burt sleep with his toupee on? <laughs> what was the answer or the question? <laughs> And I would never do that today. I wouldn't do it because I was doing it because I was getting pushed by the producers like, people want to know, people want to know. So I was thinking I was doing it on behalf of the audience. She shut down and I could see that it embarrassed her and I never got another Thanks. thing from her. So I thought, okay, that, that was wrong. I learned from that.